Welcome, folks. Uh, so today, we're going to be looking at uh, a selection uh, from a book by this philosopher right here, uh, W.D. Ross. Uh, so uh, we're going to be looking at a selection of it from this textbook right here, uh, Living Ethics by Rush J. Landau. So when I give you page numbers, I'm referring to page numbers in the Russ Schaefer Landau text. So this should be familiar from our class on Monday, uh, or from the Schaefer Landau reading. Uh, what is a prima facie duty? Well, here's how Ross puts it in his own words. He says, I suggest prima facie duty or conditional duty as a brief way of referring to the characteristic, quite distinct from that of being a duty proper, which an act has in virtue of being a certain kind, like keeping a promise, of being an act which would be a duty proper if it were not at the same time of another kind, which is morally significant. So what is Ross saying there? He's saying that an act has the property of being a prima facie duty if it would make that action in virtue of that characteristic your duty proper, like your actual moral obligations, uh, just so long as that uh, action doesn't have uh, another kind of prima facie duty attached to it, perhaps in a different direction. Right, so the idea is if an action of yours has the characteristic of keeping a promise and there are no other uh, morally relevant features of that action, uh, then you will have a moral duty to keep that promise. Uh, here's how Schaefer Landau put it on page 124 of your textbook. He says, a prima facie, which in Latin means at first view, a prima facie duty is an excellent non-absolute permanent reason to do or refrain from something. So what we're saying here is basically prima facie duties are features of the world. The way that Ross likes to put it is they're objective facts about reality uh, that in virtue of being there make it the case that you have certain moral duties. So it's, for instance, like keeping a promise. That you made a promise is an excellent uh, permanent reason. So anytime you've made a promise, that's a reason to keep your promise. Uh, but we also notice from Ross that it's a non-absolute reason, which means that it's only going to generate a moral obligation for you so long as there isn't some other moral consideration weighing it out. So what are our prima facie duties? Well, uh, we also saw this in Schaefer Landau's text but we get a list of seven from Ross, right? Those are duties of fidelity, uh, keep your promises, tell the truth, uh, reparation, right the harms that you've caused to others, gratitude, uh, make sure to uh, show appreciation for the good that others have done to you, justice, make sure that good things happen to people who do good, Sure that bad things happen to people who do bad. Beneficence, that's improving not only the pleasure, but also the virtue and intelligence of others. Self-improvement, Ross says, increase your own virtue and intelligence. And non-maleficence, you have a special reason not to harm others. And Ross thinks that you have a reason not to harm others uh, which is stronger and more stringent than your duty to help others. So we saw all that uh, last time around when we looked at Schaefer Lando's chapter itself. Now, one thing that we might worry about is, well, Ross has given us this list of seven features of the world that can give us our moral duties. Well, we might sort of worry that this kind of list of uh, prima facie duties doesn't give us any guidance through the world. What do we do when uh, our duties of fidelity, 
say, keeping a promise and telling the truth, uh, run up against our duties of non-maleficence. Uh, it seems like Ross's theory gives us no advice beyond the very straightforward and maybe even so obvious it's saying nothing type of advice that simply says, uh, do whatever is the most important. Well, Ross comes back at this by saying, well, the ideal utilitarian theory, and the philosopher that Ross has in mind uh, most predominantly here is the philosopher G.E. Moore, another significant 20th century uh, philosopher. Uh, he says, the ideal utilitarian theory can only fall back on an opinion for which no logical basis can be offered. So we sometimes say there's no logical basis for the list of seven prima facie duties in terms of what to do. Well, it seems like the ideal utilitarian is also not giving a logical proof for preferring one course of action over the other, that one uh, course of action will bring about a greater amount of goods than the other. So, uh, this is not a special problem. Uh, Ross thinks for his theory of prima facie duties. But it might also be objected that the list of prima facie duties is arbitrary. You know, we might think that, oh gosh, Ross has just given us this grab bag of seven things that are morally important, but he hasn't really told us, you know, why these seven things are so important. Well, Ross comes back and says, for one thing, loyalty to the facts is worth more than a, than a symmetrical architectonic or a hastily reached simplicity. Well, here, uh, it seems as if Ross is taking a shot at both utilitarians who say that, you know, a symmetrical architectonic, uh, that is... A straightforward theory is just going to say the right act is always the one that maximizes utility, but it's also going to uh, be a criticism of Kantians. Uh, he's going to say that simply because an action is not universalizable, for instance, we might think that that's a hastily reached simplicity. He says, if further reflection discovers a perfect logical basis for this, or a better clarification, so much the better. So. What we're seeing here is that for Ross, uh, the main thing that we want to notice is that we should be loyal to the facts, right? Uh, and he thinks that most of us will accept the thought that we have a moral duty to keep our promises, even in those cases uh, where we think that maybe breaking the promise could bring about slight gains in well-being, right? So having this list of seven prima facie duties uh, and that each of them matters for its own sake, uh, Ross is going to tell us that this is loyalty to the facts, right? Uh, and he says, yeah, maybe if you had a logical proof for a theoretical model, uh, then so much the better. But at this point, we don't have any logical reasoning for preferring a list of seven principles that we have to balance against one another as compared to a single principle, like Kant's principle of universalizability or the utilitarian's principle of utility. So here's how Ross puts it. In principle, there's no reason to anticipate that every act that is our duty is so for one and the same reason. Why should two sets of circumstances, or one set of circumstances, not possess different characteristics, uh, any one of which makes a certain act our prima facie duty? Uh, so he's saying, why say that all of our duties can be explained in terms of one principle, like the principle of utility, uh, rather than, uh, you know, a variety of principles that explain uh, why certain moral acts are morally good, or why certain immoral acts are morally wrong. 
But still, you might be bothered by this approach that Ross is taking. Uh, so we might ask Ross, how do we come to know what is morally right? So he says that an act qua fulfilling a promise or qua affecting a just distribution of goods, uh, and he gives a longer list uh, of ways that an act could be morally right, qua this or qua that, right? He says that an act is prima facie right is self-evident. So what he's saying here is that uh, you are keeping a promise, uh, it's self-evident that keeping that promise counts in favor of your action, morally speaking. So it's not just in the sense, but he's saying that uh, when we say that something is self-evidently true, that keeping a promise counts morally. He's saying it's not in the sense that it's evident from the beginning of our lives, right? Babies don't know how to keep promises. Or as soon as we attend to the pro proposition for the first time. So when you're teaching a little kid uh, about promises, they might not be able to see it. But Ross does say, but in the sense that when we have reached sufficient mental maturity, and have given sufficient attention to the proposition, it is evident without any need of proof, or of evidence beyond itself. So this is basically what Ross is saying. Uh, mature thinkers, uh, people who understand what it is to keep a promise, will just be able to see straight away that uh, promising counts in favor of an action uh, and can make it the case that you're morally obligated to do certain things. He says, it is self-evident just as a mathematical axiom or the validity of a form of inference is evident. So for instance, he's saying, it's obvious that uh, you can create a moral obligation through making a promise or that Something like uh, justly distributing resources is something you're morally obligated to do, or you might have duties of beneficence. And he says that these propositions, when you really understand them and you have mental maturity, you'll understand how these things create your obligations, just like mathematical axioms, right? So we all know certain mathematical axioms, like a number is identical to nothing but itself, or uh, the geometrical uh, claim that two parallel lines extended infinitely will never intersect, or something like uh, modus ponens or modus tollens. We learned about those argument forms earlier in the semester. Uh, Ross is saying that those things are just obviously true. He's going to say that our moral knowledge that promising counts in favor of an action is also self-evidently true. But he does qualify this. He says, our judgments about our actual duty in concrete situations have none of the certainty that attaches to our recognition of the general principles of duty. So here, Ross is at least admitting that you know, every one of our actions has multiple features to it, right? So not only uh, will my keeping a promise uh, have this feature of being a prima facie duty in terms of its being an act of promise keeping, but it will also have effects on certain other people. And those will give it some other features of prima facie duty. Uh, and with prima facie duties, for Ross, remember, uh, they're all mixed together in the real world, and the most important one is going to prevail uh, to go from prima facie duty to duty proper, right? Uh, so Ross is actually perfectly willing to admit that knowing what our duty proper is can be a very difficult question. So the way that he puts it, we can never be certain that an act is right one, uh, but he's also going to say that getting things right isn't a matter of chance either.
right? So, for instance, uh, just like it's not a matter of chance when somebody does something morally right, even though we can never really be certain that you've done the thing that you have the very most reason to do, Ross also says that you can promote your self-interest, right? But you can never really be certain uh, that the acts that you do actually have uh, promoted your self-interest to the greatest degree. So this is an interesting thing that we can notice about Ross here, is that he is not saying that we have uh, perfect moral knowledge uh, about the world when we accept his theory. In fact, knowing whether a particular action is the right one or the wrong one to do can actually be an exceedingly hard thing. Uh, in the same way that uh, for utilitarianism, it can be extremely hard to know whether the course of action that you've taken is the one that's going to maximize the overall net amount of pleasure over pain uh, for everyone, right? So Ross is also going to say, much like the utilitarians, that it can be quite hard to know whether a particular act is the right one to do. So that's it for this little discussion of the selection of uh, W.D. Ross that we find from The Right and the Good in this textbook, Living Ethics by Rush Schaefer Landau. Thanks for listening in. And here's some stuff to think about. Uh, try to answer these questions for yourself. Uh, what do you like about Ross's theory? What do you dislike about it? And maybe specifically, uh, if we look at Ross's list of seven prima facie duties, uh, beneficence, non-maleficence, uh, gratitude, reparation, fidelity, that's like promising, keeping your word, justice, and what's the one that I missed? Ah, yes, self-improvement. I always forget self-improvement. So think about that list of seven prima facie duties. You might try to think about uh, what you would add to or subtract from uh, on Ross's list, right? Maybe it's that you'd need to modify the definition of justice. Maybe it's not about making sure that virtue is rewarded and vice is punished. Maybe you've got a different way of thinking about justice. Uh, you might also take into considerations concerns like equity or concerns for justice or respect, right? So we could ask, for instance, uh, does Ross's theory uh, adequately account for something like Kant's principle of humanity? Uh, those are tough questions, uh, but if you have any thoughts about them, please don't hesitate to get in touch and let me know what you think you would uh, add to or subtract uh, from Ross's list of prima facie duties. All right, thanks for listening in.